quizzes in the sections. We'll cover the material through Thursday of this week, from France through Thursday of this week. If you will uh, look at the lecture outlines, you will have no difficulty with the, the quizzes next week. But if you don't look at the lecture outlines, you will have difficulty, as some of you found in the last uh, quiz. The last week, the sections will meet at the Enology Building for some practical exercises and sensory evaluation. Um, we're going to talk about three countries only today, and so there will not be any um, and just briefly, a couple of words about a couple of other places. First, we'll start in Western Europe, along the coast with Portugal. Portugal is a small country, but wine is one of the largest agricultural products of the country. They have some problems of surplus in some years, and have the government has organized a rather important um, program for controlling the surpluses, which is not really terribly important. There are th just three wines that I want you to remember something about, and they are, uh, two of them at least, are important for the American market. In the far north of, Madeira, of Portugal, right next to the Spanish border, they make what they call green wines, Vinhos Verdes. Uh, this is the only type of wine that I know of in the world that owes its character or its distinction to a malolactic fermentation. And it's uh, peculiar to this region, and so it's worth mentioning. Since Roman times, which greatly influenced this part of Portugal, <clears throat> they have grown grapevines on trees. 15, 20 feet up in the trees, you see the grapevine growing. Now, the circumstances of where you grow grapes on trees is that they overproduce. They have more grapes than the leaves can supply sugar to, and the result is that you get grapes of very high acid and low sugar. The average alcohol content in Vinhos Verdes, after they are first made, is around 7, 8, or 9 percent, or the range of alcohol content is around 7, 8, or 9 percent. Uh, this wine is kept in wooden cooperage uh, through the winter. It has a rather high acid, around 1.5% of acid. And sometime during the spring of the year, usually, they get a malolactic fermentation of the uh, malic acid to lactic acid, producing carbon dioxide. And during this fermentation, before it's completed, they bottle the wine. So here you have a method of making a sparkling wine uh, without using the fermentation of sugar to produce the carbon dioxide. In this case, they use the fermentation of malic acid to lactic acid to produce the carbon dioxide to give the wine its gassiness. Now, that's the prototype of the gassy Portuguese wine, which we've had on the American market since just before World War uh, II. Uh, they call them crackling wines on the American market. And they have, uh, they had an initial success, and then uh, people thought they were too acid, they were very dry, and so the Portuguese began to make imitation Vinhos Verdes. And so the most important of those rosé wines that you see on the market today are not true Vinos Verdes, they're imitations of Vinos Verdes. They're just regular pink wines to which they've added a certain amount of carbon dioxide to them. So when you see Mateus or uh, the various other kinds of sparkling wines of, from Portugal on the American market, their prototype, their original type, is this little tiny region up here in the north of Portugal. The actual type that you're getting is a sort of an imitation of that, made with regular wine and carbon dioxide added to it. I don't think you'd like Vinhos Verdes very much. I only introduced the subject because it's unique and very distinctive. 
uh, even if they, um, even at eight or nine percent alcohol, they're pretty thin. And uh, the Portuguese themselves like to drink them with, uh, with bacalao. Bacalao is cod fish. The Portuguese fishing fleet goes to Newfoundland every year and fishes for six months or so. They bring the fish home and dry it and they then soak it at some time later. It has a rather peculiar smell. Any of you that come devotees of bacalao or dried codfish will know what it smells like. It smells a little bit like um, decomposing fish, but the Portuguese like it and it goes very well, I must say, with this green, thin, acid, tart, uh, sparkling little wine from the north of uh, Portugal, but I don't think it's worth cultivating a taste for. <laughs> Most of us don't like bacalao very much anyway. The other two wine types of Portugal that are important are both dessert wines. They're wines that have been fermented partially and alcohol has been added to them. They've been fortified with alcohol at some stage in their production. They're both very important in English history and in one of them is important in American history. They both represent prototypes of wine that are produced all over the world today. By far the most important one is the Port Wine District, which is just south of Venus Verdes. It's on the Douro River, which runs up into Spain, and the big northern Portuguese town of Oporto is at the mouth of the river. And the name port comes from a wine shipped out of Oporto. So port literally means a wine that comes out of the port of Oporto. It was always popular in England because the English had a surplus of manufactured cotton goods. And they, had, they wanted to ship it someplace, so they decided to ship it to Portugal. And they made, in the beginning of the 18th century, a very favorable treaty with the Portuguese in which they agreed to take a certain amount of port wine and the Portuguese agreed to take a certain amount of cotton, manufactured cotton goods. And uh, the, the people who did this were usually doing both businesses. They were manufacturers of cotton goods in England and they were producers of port in Portugal. So they were buying for themselves and also selling for themselves. They're still called, the wine merchants in Oporto who are English, are still called rag merchants for that reason. We'll speak about one of them, we'll speak about the other rag merchant in the town. The district is a very unusual district uh, and very beautiful district. You've probably all seen wonderful pictures of the Rhine and of Switzerland and the terraced vineyards up along the sides of the, uh, the Rhine uh, River, but you've never seen anything like the terraces along the Douro River. About 40 miles inland from Oporto, begins this area that runs another 40 miles, and it's terraced for about a mile up the hillside on both sides. The terraces are terribly difficult to make. They're all schistic rock, which has been turned straight up by the movement of the earth. And it's this type of soil that makes it possible to grow grapes there because the roots penetrate down through the schist very deep into the earth, 40 and 50 feet in some cases, and they will live through this hot, dry climate. It's very hot in the Douro here and very dry. And if it weren't for this deep penetration of the roots in this particular soil formation, they would be unable to grow grapes very much. They had a terrible problem with phylloxera. The whole region was desolated with phylloxera. And it's only slowly come back since that time so that you see many areas where the terraces are no longer occupied. They have a whole melange of varieties of grapes, a whole mixture of varieties of grapes, some of them with ripening early, some of them ripening late, some of them with more color, some of them with less color, some of them with more acid, and so forth. Port is a truly manufactured wine. There is no port that's not blended. There's no port that's not made from a mixture of varieties. And the reason for this mixture of varieties is so that between the cool years and the hot years, they can always make some red port. They have to have very dark colored varieties so that in the hot years they'll have enough color. They want some not so highly colored varieties to make tawny port, and I'll explain that in just a moment, in the cool years. So between these two demands of the hot and cool years and the desire to make low colored and high colored ports, they have this mixture of varieties. It's made quite 
normally, in the old days, the grapes were actually trodden. When I was there first in 1947, they were actually treading the grapes. They had large lagaris, which are nothing more than less than about 12 foot by 12 foot concrete tanks, which were about three feet high. And they brought the grapes in whole from the vineyards, which in itself is a major achievement because of this steep terracing. Most of the grapes are brought to the winery, uh, or the quinta, they call it. Instead of a chateau, they call it a quinta. <coughs> are brought on the backs of men, carrying the grapes in and dumping them into these, this lagar here. So you have about two and a half foot of grapes in there. The traditional method, and used occasionally still today, but used every place in 1947, which isn't too long ago, was for a group of men to line up on one side. They were looking down. <coughs> About six or eight men would lock arms on the side like this, standing together, and then barefooted, of course, and raise their feet up and push it down, one after the other. And this continued, it took about two hours to go across 12 feet. Very hard work. And being very hot and inside of a building, uh, you can imagine that some perspiration probably got into the, to the juice and added some flavors to it, probably, too. At any rate, they would take a short rest, and then they would get on the other side and go across the other way. This was called the cutting of the grapes. They actually were crushing the grape bunches, the berries and the grape bunches together, with their feet by walking across them. Of the first 36 hours, they trod the grapes 18 hours. So they were in there a long time. In the daytime, of course, they brought grapes up, so they got very little sleep. They kept them awake by, by giving them a very strong brandy, uh, which they call agua pe, which means foot water. Uh, it's just pumice, distilled pumice. We call mar, eau de vie de mar in France. Very strong, very powerful. And also, in order to keep them from keep them moving, they usually have somebody with a little violin or a little accordion playing, so that they are sort of mesmerized into this. It's sort of like a, a marathon dancing sort of thing craze that we had in the 1920s and early 1930s. Because uh, they, they get l very little sleep for about three or four days. They, they work in shifts of about three or four days. Um, <coughs> As the, this process goes on for about uh, the first 36 hours, then they do it less often after that, just pressing down the camp. When the sugar content gets to about where they want it, which depends on whether they're producing a drier or sweeter port, the juice is drawn off from one corner here into tanks below and fortified with brandy up to somewhat higher percent of alcohol than we use in this country. The better the port, the higher, more alcohol they add. If they're going to make a very long-lasting port, they will fortify it right up to 21%. The lesser ports, they will fortify up to about 18%. So the fortification of the port is somewhere between 18 and 21%. At some later time, the port is brought from the port region down to a porto, where it's, where it's kept in the cellars there. It's much cooler. The port ages much better down at Oporto than it does up in the port region itself. In fact, experts can tell whether the port has been aged up the river or whether it's been aged in Oporto. Now, from this product, they make three kinds of wine. The easiest to make and the one that's sold earliest is called Ruby Port. Ruby Port is nothing less than a red port aged for two or three years has a nice red color and is the common port that you will find on the American market from Portugal and also in a, in a way represents the kind of port that we normally produce in this country, uh, a ruby type port. This is also true of South Africa and of Australia uh, about which Dr. Singleton talked last time. The second kind of port they make is called tawny port and they make two kinds of tawny port. One is more expensive than the other. If they keep a ruby port in a barrel for five, six, seven, or eight years, it gradually loses its color and becomes tawny in color. That's the most expensive kind of tawny port to make. 
by age. But instead of making it that way, they have found that it's also possible to make a young tawny port by using only tawny colored grapes. Instead of using red grapes, they use tawny colored grapes. They have several varieties of these growing in the district. They pick these grapes out specially, uh, ferment them on the skins for a couple of days. Uh, they get a tawny color. They draw them off, fortify them, and uh, by aging only one or two years, they can put a tawny port on the market. Now in the coolest years, which are the best years in this district, in contrast to the rest of Europe, where the warm years are the best years, in this district here, which is naturally very warm, the cool years are the best years. In the cooler years, like 1927, for example, was a disaster in the rest of Europe. Absolute, complete disaster. 1922 is the same thing. The two best ports of the 1920s were 1922 and 1927. The same thing was true in the 1930s. 1931 was a complete disaster in Europe. There was practically no good wine made in Northern Europe in 1931. And yet the vintage of 1931 port is considered by many to be one of the great vintage ports made in this century. And uh, 27 being perhaps the greatest in this century. Uh, and this is true right down to today. In recent years, 1967, for example, it was a terrible year in Northern Europe. 65 and 67 were both very cold, foggy years in Northern Europe. The grapes didn't get ripe. They had lots of mold and rot on them. They were terrible years. And they were very great years uh, in the port district. You can buy both 65 and 67 vintage ports, and that's what I'm coming to right now. The fourth type of, third type of port is vintage port. They set aside in these cooler years the wines with the most color and the most flavor. They select the wines with the most color and the most flavor. And they either send them to London or they do it right in Oporto nowadays. Both are done, about half and half, I guess, now. And they put them in the wood for only two years. They are only left in the wood for two years. These are the wines of high alcohol, high color and high tan and high flavor. Four characteristics that they need in a good base for a vintage port. High color, high tannin, high flavor, and high alcohol. About 21% alcohol. They put these in bottles at the end of two years, not more. Not more than two years. And then they forget about them. For a minimum of 10 years and sometimes for 20 or 30 years and they are sold as vintage ports. They're expensive, they're not cheap, but they've sort of established the reputation of the district. I was a disbeliever about vintage ports some years ago. I didn't see why they should go to all this trouble of keeping a port in the bottle for that length of time. But it is quite true, and you can demonstrate it for yourself very easily. You taste a ruby port, it's sweet, and it's, it's pleasant, and it has very little bouquet very little smell to it, mostly an alcohol smell, sometimes a rather young smell. But you take a vintage port that's been aged for 15 years, we'll say, and a vintage port of 15 years has developed a very big bouquet from this being kept in the bottle this way, which cannot be obtained by keeping it in the wood. In the wood, it gets more and more woody with time, it gets more air, and it gets more and more oxidized. These wines are quite red when they come out. They're, they're not very practical wines, I might say. First of all, the big cost of keeping them that time. And the second thing is that you bottle these wines when they were very young, and consequently they have a very big deposit. Almost always they have a deposit. The deposit can be uh, very sticky and stick to the sides of the wall and drop to the, or it could be granular and drop to the bottom or it can be very silky and float away. And so getting a bottle of vintage port open, which is first of all somewhat hard, and second, getting the wine out of it in a clear condition uh, is not always easy. If you buy a bottle of vintage port, therefore, let me give you some practical advice. First of all, stand it on end for a period of about two or three weeks. Second, do not use an ordinary corkscrew, but use one of these, I'll bring some corkscrews later, but bring one of these corkscrews that has a needle that goes through the cork and a little plunger over here at the side that pushes a little bit of air in it. The air is pushed 
through this needle, the needle is hollow. Here's the cork. Here's the level of liquid. So you put the, push some air in here. The air gets between the wine and the cork. And when you get enough air, it pushes that cork right out. Uh, if you try and do these old corks with a corkscrew, more often than not, you'll pull them right out. They, 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 they'll, the corkscrew will pull out and leave the cork in. The reason for that is that these people are very perverse, very great traditionalists. And instead of making the sides of the port bottle straight up and down, they make them this way. So that it sort of flanges out, the cork does here, and it's very tight up there. And after you've been in there for 15, 20 years, you can pull this first part out, but the bottom part will break off and because it's, it's more fanned out. So the best way to do them is to push them out with some air. Then having gotten them out, take another empty bottle or a decanter or a pitcher, it doesn't make any difference which one you use, and very carefully pour the wine out of this bottle into the other bottle or into the decanter with a little light or something underneath here to see when this deposit, which is down here, begins to get up to the neck of the bottle. If you have it on an angle over here, as the wine is coming out, you put a little light here of some kind, candle, some people use a candle, and as this deposit here begins to move down and so forth, as the bottle is turned further and further over, you can see the deposit coming out. Sometimes you'll lose an inch of wine with an old port. I've seen old ports that were almost impossible to get out, where they had very silky cloudiness. It's a very interesting study of the different kinds of, of deposits in port. Anyway, it's worth once in your, in your lifetime, this experience, and I encourage you to find some rich aunt or rich uncle or cousin who has some port uh, in their cellar and take a look at it and see if you can find the vintage port there and then persuade them by some <coughs> means, promise them anything, and, um, and get a bottle of it open for your delection. There's a French advertisement that promise her anything but give her something, some kind of perfume, I think it was. The taste for, uh, the taste for port has decreased in this century, uh, particularly in England, and I think there's a good reason for it. Uh, port is a, all right when you don't have any central heating. And England didn't have central heating until this century. And a lot of places in England you can go now, country hotels and so forth, where there is very little central heating. A couple of glasses of port just before you go to bed will, will get you to bed without freezing to death. And uh, that also goes in winter season, little pubs all over England. People going home will stop. They'll have a pint of beer. That's the Englishman's real drink but they'll also stop and have a glass of port in many cases. Surprisingly enough, however, at the present moment, the biggest sale of port is in France, not in England. We don't know any reason for this. We don't know why the French have suddenly decided they like port, but they do like port. They're the largest bottler, buyers of port. They buy the cheaper brands of port there, but nevertheless, they buy port. The second kind of fortified wine that's made in Portugal is in the Madeira Islands. These islands are about 600 miles off the coast. They're a little bit further south than I've indicated here. When the clipper ships sailed from Salem to the Mediterranean and so forth, they stopped at the Madeira Islands to pick up water and veg fresh vegetables and fresh oranges and bananas and pineapples and so forth. They were discovered before America. They were colonized. And uh, they became an important part of the Portuguese economy. They made these wines quite naturally up until the 1850s, as the grapes were picked rather late in the season, when they were partially raisined. They made a white wine out of them, which usually the fermentation stuck at about 15% alcohol and 4 or 5% sugar. These wines were aged in wood for a long time. As to why they didn't get any lactic acid bacteria on the islands, I don't know but there doesn't seem to have been many problems with it. And America became the largest consumer of these wines. There was more Madeira consumed here at the time of the Revolutionary War than any place else in the world. We had more sh ships at sea at that time, too. Uh, we had a very large merchant marine at the time of the Revolutionary War and after the Revolutionary War. And as these ships went to and from the Mediterranean, they stopped at the Madeira Islands, picked up these quite alcoholic, semi-dry or sweet white wines 
which they brought back to Philadelphia, to Salem and mm. Boston and Massachusetts, uh, all along the Atlantic seaboard, where they were then bought up by families and put in demijohns, kept in demijohns, and some of them were kept for 50 or 100 years thereafter. Others were put in bottles and sold immediately. People don't believe the story that Madeira was important until some years ago I found a wine list from the Hotel Astor in New York for 1828. There were about 25 or 30 wines on the list, of which half of them were Madeiras. Half of the wines were Madeiras. The other half of the wines were French and German and Italian. The most expensive champagne was $2.50 or something like that. But the most expensive wine on the list was a Madeira at $6 a bottle. That would be something like $20 a bottle at the present time. This little piece of evidence to me, and there's many others of the same kind, indicates that not only we were we great drinkers of Madeira, we, half the wine list was Madeira, but we were also great connoisseurs of Madeira. We were willing to pay more for Madeira than any French wine. And they had Madeiras of different age, named after the ship they came on in some cases, named after the man who imported them in some cases, or in few cases where a family died out and so forth, they'd be named after the family who had aged them, and they would be selling demijohns, five-gallon demijohns of this Madeira and that Madeira. Well, in 1850, thanks to us, this was all destroyed, completely destroyed, destroyed within a period of about 20 years. First of all, they got uh, uh, mildew from the United States, both down in cottony mildew or iridium, then they got black rot, another fungus disease, and uh, finally, they got a disease called anthracnose from there. Three important fungus diseases were established in the Madeira Islands all within a period of about 15 years. In this warm, humid climate, where there had been no fungus diseases uh, that grapes were subject to, or a few that grapes were subject to before that, in a period of almost 300 years, they were just, the islands were discovered in 1520. <coughs> Uh, 1420, excuse me, 1420, so it was four, almost 400 years they had been fungus free and suddenly the American, somebody brought in some American grapes with uh, all these fungus diseases on them, different times one and the other one, and they attacked the grapes and there was no grapes to be obtained on the island. Or if they did pick the grapes, they had to pick them very early. So instead of having wines of 15% of alcohol, they had wines of 8 and 9% of alcohol. And that still continues till today. The American fungus diseases forces the very early harvesting of grapes on this semi-tropical island. And so the new wines are very low in alcohol. Nowadays, they're a little bit better than it was 15, 20 years ago. But even so, it's very rare to get a wine up to 11% alcohol by itself. These wines spoiled very quickly. Cetobacter took over, and they formed vinegar instead of wine. It didn't age in the wood. If they left it in the wood, it just would disappear, literally decompose. There wasn't enough alcohol to keep it in the wood for a very long period of time. So beginning in about the 1870s, they devised a method by which they could keep the wine, and that was to pasteurize all the wine. They pasteurized the new wines at 140 degrees Fahrenheit for a period of about three months. That's the maximum, something less than that, usually. And they found that these wines, when they were heated this long a period of time in these wooden containers, took on a different flavor. They took on a caramelized flavor. They darkened in color, and so they were different from what they started. But they didn't spoil after this pasteurization. At least they hadn't spoiled by that time. And they, were, uh, they were, could be sold for themselves. They also learned to add a little alcohol to them, to pep them up a little bit. And finally, they learned to fortify some grape juice and age that separately. And they would blend in some grape juice, some fortified grape juice, some white wine, and some alcohol. And that's the way Madeira is made today. And then bake it. And then bake it. It's, in a way, the way that California sherry is made. Most California sherry is made by a baking process. So instead of calling it sherry, we would probably have been better off if we called it California Madeira, because it owes its primary flavor, in most cases, not all cases, to the, this caramelized flavor that you get 
from baking for a long period of time. Well, it isn't very good wine today. It's a disappearing district. It's not very good because it um, has this too much of the caramelized character, I think. And besides, they still have acetobacter problems. Almost always you can tell a Madeira from Madeira Islands by the fact that it will have more vinegar smell than any other wine. Also, they've done a little bit of, uh, what shall I say, um, fudging, I think that's a good word. Uh, they have um, they've gotten in the habit of giving wines dates that are, um, if not uh, illegal, at least partially so. You can buy in Sacramento, $20 a bottle, Madeiras that will say 1870, 1880, 1890, and so forth. Professor Ressler in the mathematics department and I have figured out that this is a violation of the law of compound interest. Uh, if you figure out that they only paid a dollar a gallon for the wine in 1870, the cost of the wine today, just in terms of normal compound interest, is going to be much greater than what they're selling it at, particularly in view of the fact that it'll also become more acid with time if it's aged for a long period of time and so forth. My advice is don't pay $20 for any bottle of Madeira even for the experience sake or for display. If you need really badly to spend $20 a bottle on wine, invite me over and I'll show you which wine to, to, to buy. <laughs> and it won't be Madeira either. Anyway, there's only a small export trade to this country, a small export trade to, the, to Great Britain, and that's about all we can say. It only represents, however, a very interesting story that the world is very it's much smaller than we think, and just the innocent importation of a few American grapes completely changed the nature of all the wines produced on the Madeira Islands. That isn't quite the end of the story, though. The end of the story is that about 1880 or 1885, they got phylloxera on the island. And phylloxera had a perfect feast day. So between about 1880 and 1890, they didn't grow any grapes on the island. When they replanted them, they replanted uh, them on resistant stocks in some cases or they even brought in some American grapes and planted them directly. And uh, the most important grape on the island today is an American grape called Jacques. It's a hybrid with American blood in it and has a little foxy flavor. By heating it or baking it, they get rid of the American flavor. So that further changes the character of the wine. So between the fungus diseases and the insect disease, phylloxera, we've had a baneful effect on the Madeira Islands and probably have destroyed the Madeira Islands as a wine producing area in the far distant future. Now Spain is an anomalous country that has the largest acreage of grapes in the world and has only the third largest production which simply means that they grow less tons of grapes per acre of grapes than any place else in Europe and has one of the lowest rates of production in the world. It's because the whole central plateau of the country is so dry, Castile is so dry, that they have to put the grapes far apart, 20 foot apart in some cases. And even in La Mancha, which is the biggest district, this district of Don Quixote down here, the La Mancha district, the grapes will be quite a ways apart from each other because there's just not enough water to bring uh, the grapes to maturity uh, unless they plant them far apart. We'll just speak of three wines, one table wine and two <coughs> dessert wines, exactly as Portugal. One table wine and two dessert wines in Portugal. The table wine is in the Rioja. The Rioja is another bit of evidence of the effect of phylloxera. When phylloxera came to the south of France in the 1870s and 1880s, the people looked up at the Pyrenees and they said, well, that phylloxera can never fly across the Pyrenees. It will never get to Spain. And so several thousand French people migrated from France, from the south of France, to the Rioja district and planted vineyards and built wineries. Company Franco Espanol gives an idea of the fact that they were French and Spanish uh, companies. The methods of growing the grapes and the methods of uh, taking care of the wine are all French, 50 gallon barrels and all sorts of things that are French in idea. Their idea was that they would be protected from phylloxera forever. The sad fact is that phylloxera didn't find any difficulty in getting over the Pyrenees Mountains. It just went around them and somebody surreptitiously bought some American grapes in and phylloxera had destroyed the vineyards of Rioja by 1900. 
But the orig original development of the Rioja was because of phylloxera. It was by the fact that these poor people in France had been forced out of France. They had nothing to, to grow there, and they went to an area where they thought they would have something to grow. There are still French-speaking families in the Rioja district, and the French influence is still there. And the, the red wines of the Rioja, I think, are worth trying. They're not terribly great wines. The varieties they have are not great. They use two red varieties, one of which you have here in California, Grenache, and the other which we don't have here in California, Tempranillo. These two red varieties mixed together, aged in the 50-gallon barrels for a year or two, and then bottled, make a very pleasant, if not great, uh, red wine. Now, the two significant kinds of wines in, in Spain, ones that have, represent two significant types of wine, are Malaga, near the town of Malaga on the east coast, and the Sherry District, which is down near Cadiz on the south coast. Let's talk about Malaga first because we can dispose of it very quickly. In the Malaga District, they grow the grapes up on the hillsides, back of the town. They grow some Muscat grapes, and they also grow some non-Muscat grapes. The grapes dry right on the vine. The Muscat grapes, in some cases, are picked and allowed to dry on trays. And that's where we get the word Malaga for a ra Muscat raisin grape. It's a raisin grape, or raisins, shipped out of the town of Malaga. I can remember at Christmas time, even though we lived in Madeira and made raisins ourselves, somebody in the family, as a sort of joke, would buy in San Francisco a genuine box of Muscat raisins. The whole raisin cluster pressed out flat, costing quite a bit of money, uh, and shipped all around the world as sort of a Christmas treat. It was called a Malaga raisin. In fact, Australia still calls all raisins Malagas for that reason. A raisin is really a Malaga in, uh, in uh, Australia. Well, they took some of these grapes before they became completely raisined and made wine on them. Pressed them by very hard pressing and uh, let them ferment very slowly. Australia. Well, they took some of these grapes before they became completely raisined and made wine on them. Pressed them by very hard pressing and uh, let them ferment very slowly. And it's one of the few wines in the world that have more sugar than alcohol. These wines had so much sugar, they're being raisins, that the fermentation stuck with about 15% of alcohol and about 18 to 20% of sugar. So these are sweet wines, very sweet wines, very low acid wines, very flat which have very high sugar and relatively low alcohol content. They're nice wines to give to your elderly, feeble, old maid aunt with cookies in the late afternoon. If you have any such relatives, that's, this is the wine for her. But for normal people, I don't think they like the raisiny flavor. It's like treckle, and it, you don't want to have molasses on cookies at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At least I don't want that. They're quite reasonable in price because they don't have very much quality. There's not very much demand for them. But you can buy them now on the American market around $2 a bottle. And they're a curiosity. They, I think they make, they're better if they're made into some sort of cooking thing like zabioni or put in some kinds of puddings and things like that that need a raisin flavor than they are by themselves. But if you want to try them, they're, they're, they're interesting. Now, the sherry process is technologically and economically the most important wine of Spain and the most important wine that I'll have to talk about uh, today. These wines have been known for a very long time in England, where they were called sack. Shakespeare has a very great speech for Falstaff in The Merry Wise of Windsor, in which he extols the virtues of, of sack does almost everything for Falstaff. Well, Falstaff didn't require much urging to be able to do everything, I guess. At any rate, uh, the, the types of wines made here are very important uh, historically. Also, a part of the Napoleonic Wars was based upon the fact that 
Napoleon's armies had conquered the whole of the peninsula and had cut off the supply of sherry for Great Britain. And the great Battle of Trafalgar was fought right down here, right off the coast of Spain. And a part of Wellington's whole campaign was to start in Portugal and push the French out of Spain. And actually, that's what Wellington did. And a part of the reason he did it was to get back the port region, the most important market was Great Britain, and the other part of it was to get back the Sherry region, which was the most important uh, wine from Spain that was sold in England at that time. So it has historically an importance too. These were wines of rather high alcohol, uh, 15 to 20 percent in alcohol. They came in a variety of styles and uh, great differences in quality, very high quality in some cases and so forth. They were, had also become industrialized at a fairly early stage. There are a number of sherry companies uh, in this region that are more than 100 years old at the present time with very great investments in vineyards, big investments in the bodegas, the cellars, and so forth. Now, essentially, they make two kinds of sherry. And they're both important, but one is much more important than the other. The most important kind of sherry that's made is the ones called finos. These are wines that they pick ordinary white grapes. They used to tread them, but nowadays they use presses. Uh, the, the white juice is fermented, just like any white wine, any place in the world. And then after it's fermented, it's left in these 130, 40 gallon butts. They're called butts there, B-U-T-T-S. The containers for port are called pipes. The containers for sherry are called butts. They're allowed in the, to stay in these butts in containers that are about three-fourths to seven-eighths full. Now, any well-behaved wine any place else in the world will, under those circumstances, get an acetobacter film within weeks or within months and will turn to vinegar. That's the normal way that wine would be made if we paid no attention to it. We prevent that, as you very well know, in other parts of Europe by keeping the barrel full so that there's no air in, in the container. But in the Sherry District, everything being different in the Sherry District, they don't keep the barrel full. They leave it three-fourths full, and it doesn't get an acetobacter film on it. Now, there's one pretty good reason why. In this district, the normal alcohol content runs between 14 and 15 percent. So with this high alcohol, acetobacter is to a certain extent prevented from growing, or it's at least it's, it doesn't grow as actively at 14 percent as it does at 9 and 10 percent. And that tends to keep down the acetobacter. Second, there is very quickly after the fermentation is over an invasion of yeast cells growing on the surface as a film. Or as the Spanish say, the wine is in flowering. It's flowering. They say it has a flores on it. It's a flower on the third. And it looks just like cream on the surface of milk. Sometimes it becomes wrinkled. Sometimes it's cream colored. Sometimes it's gray colored. Sometimes it's dark. This film protects the whole surface from acetobacter getting in. So for these two reasons, the high alcohol, and the rapid formation of a film on the surface prevents the acetobacter from developing. As a matter of fact, if any acetobacter has developed, this particular yeast will metabolize the acetic acid. It will actually chew up the acetic acid in its own metabolism, and uh, so you can, uh, the, the wine will not be high in acetic acid. This is because in the whole south of France, it's not only true in Sherry, but it's true over here in Cordoba and Montillas. There are several little areas up near Madrid uh, where this is true. The characteristic yeast that ferments the grape juice is also capable of growing in an oxidative stage in which it uses alcohol growing here on the surface of the wine to produce acetaldehyde. So, as Dr. Singleton told you, the last product produced by fermentation is acetaldehyde before the alcohol. When the process is reversed and goes the other direction, as it does under this film yeast, it takes the alcohol and brings it back to the acetaldehyde. <coughs> so the acetaldehyde increases, 
and gives a peculiar flavor to these phenotype of sherry. They're rather tricky to do. You can see that it doesn't always go as you wish, would like. In addition to that, the yeast, as I've already indicated, they have different colors. They also have different rates of production of acetaldehyde, and they seem in some cases to produce a slight differences in flavor. So that you have produced then already at the very beginning of the fermentation a number of wines which have a film yeast on them and which have produced a whole variety of phenotype of wine. Now I told you there were two kinds of sherries, the other is an Oloroso. An Oloroso. The Oloroso sherries, when they, they look at these barrels after they're fermented, and if the wine is rather oxidized, it doesn't have a good smell and so forth, you may have several thousand barrels out in the courtyard fermenting, and as they begin to look at them after the fermentation, some of them form a nice film, they leave those alone, but some of the others will be dark in color, they won't like the smell quite as well, they'll be a little raisiny in smell and other things like that. These wines are fortified with alcohol, up to 18% alcohol, and aged by themselves. So Olorosos are really just aged white wine from the Sherry District. They sometimes add grape juice to them and blend them, and that's what your cream sherries are on the American market. You can buy Brist Harvey's Bristol Cream, which has a terrible price of $6 a bottle or something like that. You will be getting an Oloroso, an Oloroso that's quite sweet. And some people like it very much. Other people don't like it so much. The better kind of sherries, however, in my opinion, and this is against the American market's belief, is the, is the, the phenom. These can be quite dry. In some cases, they're just slightly sweet. They're the better kind of aperitif wines. You have to sort of cultivate a taste for them. Now, this alone would not be uh, the, the only reason for thinking about sherry technologically. The other reason is they have a particular method of aging them, whether they're Olorosos or whether they're Finos. And this is called the Solera system. It's not very difficult to understand. <coughs> Let's say you have, you're just starting out, and you got to buy a cellar, and you have some wine that's three years old there, three-year-old sherry. We'll say it's a phenol. And you also have some that's two years old, and you also have some that's one years old. And you get an order from San Francisco for a thousand cases of sherry. This represents one barrel, but there are many barrels in this whole series here. This age, and many barrels in this one, and many barrels in this one. So you draw off from each barrel, from underneath the film, they still have their film yeast on them, you draw off a certain amount of wine. Let's say you take 25 gallons out of each barrel, all the way along here. Then you fill that barrel up from underneath the yeast and the one above, and you fill that one from underneath the yeast up above, and you fill that one with current wine. And so it goes to San Francisco. A year later, a year goes by. Now this first barrel here, we'll say that you take out a fourth. We'll say you take out a fourth. So what we have in this barrel now, we have uh, three-fourths of three-year-old wine and one-fourth of two-year-old wine. Because we took one-fourth out, of three-year-old wine, and we filled it with one-fourth of two-year-old wine. Now a year goes by, and you're the wine merchant in San Francisco, and you like that sherry, so you order another thousand cases. Well, a year has gone by, and so now what you have in this barrel, after one year, is three-fourths of the wine that's four years old, and one-fourth of the wine that's three years old. Because this wine has been allowed to go over for one more year, so the three-year wine has become four years old, and the two-year wine has become three years old. Well, now, if you continue this for many years, you get a curious sort of thing. If you would not guess by just thing, the average age of the wine coming out, and this is the number of years of operation. It was three at the start. It gradually goes up. It's about three and 
seven tenths after one year, and it will continue to go up at, for a certain number of years. But finally, depending on how frequently you draw off of it, how frequently you milk the solera, the wine that comes off at the end, after eight or ten years out here, the wine that's coming out of this last barrel will come to a constant age of about seven to eight years. And no matter how long the solera is operated from then on, the wine comes out at the same age. So the purpose of the solera is to produce wine of a constant age and a constant flavor. Even if you put in some current wine that wasn't quite the same as in the solera, it would be blended into this one, and then into this one, and then into this one, and it would, it would acquire the characteristics, more or less, of the solera. So it's very difficult with the solera system to change all at once. It's an expensive system. You've got a lot of barrels tied up here. It's called a fractional blending system. It also spreads contamination in some cases. But it does help to keep all these different types of phenols and Oloroso separate because we have one solera for a dry pheno, another solera for a semi-sweet pheno, one solera for a slightly sweet Oloroso, another solera for Harvey's Bristol Cream. Uh, and so they are able to produce a wide variety of sherries from a limited quantity of original type of wine.